the end of the energy videos. Thank you for staying with me. Let me do a quick whirlwind summary. Our culture is energy blind. We don't recognize the importance and ubiquity of energy supporting our current lifestyles. Energy is important in nature. It underpins natural systems and has been a driver of evolution. Energy also impacts human systems and the vast armies of fossil workers that came out of the ground a couple hundred years ago have given us huge benefits in the form of higher wages, higher profits, lower price stuff. We've continued to expand the scale of our energy use to now every American on average uses 100, 100 watt light bulbs per person, which is around 10,000 watts per day. We have the metabolism of about a 30 ton animal. This metabolism in burning fossil carbon five to 10 million times faster than it was sequestered is having large but slow impacts on the environment the ocean, the atmosphere. Energy is linked to the size of our economies and it will remain so. We can get a little bit more efficient here and there with technology, but basically GDP is a function of how much energy we burn. Energy is ubiquitous in our economies and if the cost goes up, it has a ripple effect through all kinds of other things that we do. We're separated from the things we want by barriers of time, complexity and energy and everything we do will become more expensive if we can't reduce the energy consumption of specific processes faster than prices grow. Fossil carbon is non-renewable on human time scales. We've accessed the best first. The stuff that's left is more costly environmentally and energy terms. The United States now is the world's largest oil producer but we're at the source rock. There's nothing left after that and it depletes very rapidly and is very costly. So this is not the narrative we're hearing in the media. Energy differs in the properties that it provides both in nature and in human systems and a stochastic, more intermittent renewable future is possibly a mismatch with our current just-in-time delivery global transportation infrastructure. We're headed for an increasingly complex energy system and also a lower quality energy system than we've become accustomed to and this has implications. The good news is, if we pause to reflect on it, that we don't need all this energy and stuff to be happy. We need enough to have our basic needs met and a little bit more, but a lot of the energy we're using today is wasted. So some context here. We naturally understand that baby elephants need to eat in order to grow. But when they grow up, then they stop growing. Similarly, we naturally understand that human babies need to eat to grow. But they stop growing, at least vertically, around 20 years old. But our current culture has an embedded belief that human economies are somehow exempt from this biological rule. Possibly because famous examples warning about growth in the past were wrong, like Thomas Malthus and Paul Ehrlich. Well, they weren't really wrong. They just didn't have the full picture. Malthus made his predictions before we found fossil carbon. Ehrlich warned about limits before we used globalization and debt as a way to pull resources forward in time. It is possible we can grow for a while longer, but all of our institutions implicitly expect growth to continue throughout this century. Could they say otherwise? There are many governmental forecasts for global growth the first half of this century. Most are between 2 and 3% annual growth. Shown above is an OECD government forecast to 2050 for the world's major countries. Such a tripling in the size of the world economy, if we continue the average historical annual energy efficiency improvement of the last 50 years of 0.5% a year, would result in us using 2.5 times the energy we use today as a global culture in 2050. Can this happen? What would be the impacts on the biosphere, forests, and other species if it does? What would be the impacts if it doesn't? You should all now understand a bit more about the drivers and constraints underpinning this question. All of modern economic theory was invented and articulated during the period contained in the red box above. The early economists' attempt to turn physics into economic science were assisted by a continued access to the one-time carbon pulse, 
but this energy flux underpinning our society is not repeatable, and our institutions will eventually have to adapt to a more realistic future trajectories. Long-term growth was not the norm. It's important to be aware that we are live during a unique exponential growth period shown in that red box. Despite the conversation about future energy and economic growth, we already are witnessing social limits to growth, as evidenced by the yellow vests in France, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump being our presidential candidates in the USA, and populist movements all around the world. Growth has slowed in aggregate, but most of the growth is going only to the top. Only the top 5 or 10% or so of income earners in the United States are earning more than they did 15 years ago. When we used to have very sharp periods of growth, it was easier to spread to all sectors of society. This is no longer the case. The sharp rise in energy prices from 1999 to 2008 or so took a lot of wind out of the sails of the United States and global economy. And the recovery since then has been based on cheap money, debt, and global financial guarantees. It's worked so far, but it's resulted more in growth of financial assets and to the top 5% of income earners, and it's also not sustainable. We are living in this tiny geologic sliver of time we refer to as the carbon pulse. We're probably somewhere between the blue and the red stars on this graph. The good news is we probably don't remotely have enough affordable carbon to reach the Armageddon climate scenario suggested by the IPCC economists. The bad news is hardly anyone is planning for a world with a smaller energy footprint, which would mean less benefits to the average human. If you think of the future as four possible scenarios, the top left is green growth. We'll continue to grow and we'll do so with such an energy surplus we'll be able to solve our environmental problems. The top right is we'll continue to grow, but we'll do so in a dirty Mordor-like fashion. The bottom left is we won't continue to grow. We'll have a smaller economy. It'll be informed by wise social governance, respect other species and other generations, kind of the best of what humans are capable of. And then the fourth quadrant is we won't grow and we won't have social cohesion, sort of like a Mad Max scenario. Now, what's interesting is when we're exposed to these scenarios, our mind gravitates to quadrant one and quadrant four. Everything's going to work out and be great or everything sucks and nothing's going to work. That's because both of those scenarios have one thing in common. It means we don't have to do anything about it. Everything's going to be fine or we're screwed means it obviates any personal responsibility to be involved and to change. We don't know what the odds of these four scenarios are, although I think green growth is pretty unlikely, and I think Mad Max is pretty unlikely. I think, ironically, quadrants two and three are the most likely, and we have the fewest people working on them. So what sort of things would fit in quadrant three? Well, imagine the best 10 experiences of your life. If you're like most people, and not an adrenaline junkie, most of those things required very little exosomatic energy. So recognition that most of the time the best things in life are free by more people may hopefully lead to some future cultural transition where we start to appreciate energy and use it in different ways towards more sustainable objectives. Specifics on how to do that are beyond the scope of this video, but generally taxing the bads of GDP and subsidizing the goods would be a good start. Taxing financial transactions and non-renewable resources like copper or oil, and not taxing human labor or income might be one good idea. Okay, to conclude, energy is invisible to most Americans, indeed to most humans. I hope this video series, which was about the length of two Game of Thrones episodes, has allowed you to see energy in a new way. We can't know how being more energy woke will change our futures. Certainly, if we explained that there was a gazelle problem to a cheetah, it probably wouldn't change its behavior. But humans can learn, share, cooperate, and use intelligent foresight to be very creative. Who knows what might happen if 5-10% to 10 of our population became energy and systems aware. So, here's some core takeaways from this energy video series for college students. First, learn to see the influence and importance of energy in your lives. 
energy before these videos might be invisible. Now it's visible. Number two, learn to appreciate the massive benefits that energy gives us. The next time you're on an airplane, frickin' A, look out the window at what an amazing experience this is on the backs of fossil carbon. Number three, you might think about how this energy economy synthesis might affect your field of study and your career. Consider how you might make better future choices given that energy is probably going to become more expensive and less abundant during your lifetime. How might you combine this new knowledge in a productive, pro-social way to help your community, Minnesota, and the world? Here's a task for you. If you had to sum up these videos in a one-minute spiel, how would you tell your best friend what you just learned about energy? Do you think it's important that people know these things? I hope you learned a few things about energy and are able to integrate them into the way you think about the world and your life and career. The next and final Nexus video series will be about fitting everything together in the big picture. In addition to human behavior and energy, we're now going to add in ecology, systems, the world, the future. What does it mean to be alive at this amazing and perilous time? What are some things you can do personally in your own lives to be more resilient? to have more of a role in our future. Thank you. Talk to you soon.